so it's pretty diverse. Um, I've had patients who were sex workers. I've had patients who were elderly and brought in from nursing homes, elderly patients brought in from home where their sons or daughters take care of them at home, a big homeless population. There's a lot of uh, what we call frequent flyers. We probably shouldn't, but we call them frequent flyers because they come in often. And so they use the ER as like their primary care. Like, oh, I'm having the same problem that I've been having. I'm just going to come here and get it dealt with today or whatever. Or sometimes, um, you know, people who are homeless don't necessarily want to be tied down in the hospital. So they come at the last minute. They come when I just couldn't bear it. You know, I've been having this problem for quite some time. Um, but now that it's kind of affected my walk, like I'm going to have to come in, that kind of thing. And so, you know, that exacerbates um, whatever problems they may have uh, and, and, and completely and makes their care complex. And so we run the gamut. Um, like I said before, we may even have um, parents who bring in small babies, small children. We have an area that we call fast track. So a lot of times uh, in the ER, everybody who comes, it's not an emergency, right? And so we have a, a place where we deal with, it's not really an emergency. It might be urgent care. It might be something that you couldn't wait to a two week appointment with your primary care doctor or your pediatrician. So you come into the ER and we'll take care of it. That way you don't have to wait a long time. Um, and we're helping the community. It's a community need and it can be like, well, this is not an emergency. Go home and figure it out kind of thing. It, you know, it, you can still be helped. Um, so th that's a whole gamut of individuals, people who may have gastritis and they have a gastritis flare up. Right. And so they would want to come in because they're in a lot of pain. People who have sickle cell and they're in a sickle cell crisis and they want to come in because they're in a lot of pain. And so, you know, their pain management only gives them so much for so long, that kind of thing. Um, so we can see anywhere from, um, and I think 40% of the population that is admitted to Olympia are African-Americans. So there's a huge African-American population. There's only 13% in, in the, the country alone. So 40% is huge. Um, and then of course there's a Latino population um, and a white population as well that comes in to Olympia. And you know, a lot of people who live in that, the community, they call it the Miracle Mile. So a lot of people who live in the Miracle Mile community um, treat Olympia like their primary care um, facility for pretty much anything that they need. We may even have, because it's so close to Beverly Hills, we may even have a, a couple of famous people come through Olympia ER. So um, and very diverse, very diverse in addition to treating, I think, vulnerable populations. I think Olympia has um, been one of the places that pride themselves on the fastest wait times in Los Angeles County. Like, so you were never really in the waiting room more than 10 minutes. And I, I know there are no ERs that can say that. Uh, like people will wait for, for hours before they were even triaged even. Uh, so as soon as you're in there 10 minutes, we're triaging you and trying to figure out where we're going to put you and what the plan of care is. And even sometimes when um, we are busy and the patient has been triaged, the doctor already knows what the plan is, right? So even if you're waiting in the waiting room, the doctor still has worked on your chart and knows what it is. There may even be orders in there for you, right? And so that's another way that they, you know, get people in and get people out, which is the primary goal, especially when it's not necessarily uh, an emergent issue. So I went on disability October 2020. They informed Olympia's employees on December 31st, 2020 via an announcement letter, like in the community rooms, like in the break room, that kind of thing, whatever, where you go by and like, oh, what does this say on the wall? Right. And so because I am in a group chat with all of my colleagues, um, they took a picture of it and they put it in the group chat, right? So me and the, another nurse who was on maternity leave got it in a group chat. And they, you know, basically said, hey, you know, we are going to close our doors officially in March 31st. We sold the hospital to UCLA. We are voluntarily <laughs> closing our doors. So we are not going to offer any more health service. And, you know, in, in between time, we're going to kind of phase it out. But the be all, end all be all is going to be March 31st. Sorry to have to tell you that kind of thing. And so I was like shocked, shocked, appalled, like all the negative adjectives you can think of because I was like, number one, it's the middle of the pandemic, right? And so not only 
before the pandemic did we have vulnerable populations that we served but now in the pandemic these these vulnerable populations are also exacerbated in terms of the mental health patients that we've talked about the elderly patients that we talked about the local community patients the 40 percent of african-american population that we serve and we all know that african-americans are underserved in so many capacities when it comes to health care and so for them to to even think that this was a good idea right now. Like I understand it's business, I get it, that's great. You have a business, you can make these type of decisions, voila. But it's in the middle of a pandemic and I just could not believe it. And so what I started doing is I started to work closely with the, the nurses union uh, because I just, I could not believe it. I could not even stomach. So even in my disability, I've been working with them. I've given a number of interviews. Um, I've been to a number of meetings. I've talked to a number of officials from political figures to community members, to community leadership and all of this uh, in an effort to express the outrage. Um, because one of the things that you have to do when you close an emergency department is you have to have a public hearing. And that public hearing is not necessarily to argue whether or not they can. It's really to inform the community that they will. Right. And so, you know, with at all costs, you want the community to treat it like <laughs> it's our last dire need to, to kind of keep it open, that kind of thing. And so the CEO of Olympia basically laid out a PowerPoint presentation as to what Olympia is not. Oh, we are not certified to um, have um, provide obstetric care. We are not certified to uh, admit pediatric patients, that kind of thing, to to corroborate um, the decision making behind closing the hospital down, uh, which I found appalling to say the least. And I did express my concerns in that public hearing. Uh, number one, because just because we weren't certified or whatever the, the verbiage is, um, did not mean that we did not see those patients, that we did not have pediatric patients, that we did, we delivered babies. There were people who came to the wrong place, but that baby got delivered and they were well, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, to, to, to have someone so succinctly categorize what it was that um, we were doing, what it was that Olympia was and say, you know, it's just a business, business decision over the years. You know, we've made less money. So, boom, it is what it is. Um, Show that there was no care in health care for me, um, the way that they informed everybody. So like in addition to having that letter a few months later, I don't know, months, weeks later, um, I received it in the mail. And so it basically gave you a list of the 400 something amount people who were no longer going to have a job after March 31st. And I was like, what was the point of that? Like, so it says, you know, 200 RNs, this many, this person's, this many, that person, this many, that there was a whole list. In addition to a letter said, I regret to inform you. Yeah, but that's what we're doing kind of thing. Sorry. Goodbye. Right. So it didn't talk about any plans. It didn't talk about the 401k. It didn't talk about any severance package, anything like that, just to let you know. And look how many people on this list. And that's it. Uh, and so to me, it was like a tenderless, you know, interaction. And it just made me think about, you know, how healthcare has been made into big business and and how a lot of decisions are based on business and not necessarily based on need, which I think that it should be. It should definitely be based on need. Um, and resources should be given based on need. And like, this is, this is how for me, especially in my research, this is how you mitigate some of the disparities and the disproportionalities that we deal with is to render these resources based on need. If this community has a high elderly population, it behooves us to have some elderly population doctors here. You know what I'm saying? It behooves us to have these types of things here because we know that this population needs it. Right. And so to shut down, down a community hospital <laughs> within a community that clearly needs it was, you know, it made me speechless. Oftentimes, 
when patients are not trauma one patients, meaning, oh, I didn't have a massive heart attack and now I need my, my, my LAD to be unclogged and so I'm going to Cedars. When they are not that, um, we get the runoff. When Cedars doesn't have five of those patients, you know, are they available right now? And does that mean that your emergent issue does not need to be addressed within the next couple of hours? No, it just means that this needs to happen now and maybe yours needs to happen in two hours, right? And who can get you in in two hours? Olympia. And so, you know, to have those, to be be aware of those type of situations and that, that type of need, uh, and then to have someone who makes the decision not aware of those types of situations and that type of need is, is, is frustrating. In that public hearing, there were there were emergency officials, there were LAFD, there was LA County, um, LA City Fire Department. Everybody was able to come and chime in and actually give data to give what would happen. What would happen if all of the ambulances had to be rerouted to another place? What would happen if, you know, these, there were a lot of neighboring nursing homes in that community. And so because there are a lot of neighboring nursing homes, a lot of them are funneled into Olympia, right? So you have these people with exacerbated UTIs, borderline sepsis, they need liquids, antibiotics now. Like how long do these patients will have to wait now that Olympia doesn't exist at wherever they're rerouted to? One of the explanations was that, oh, you know, they could go to Ronald Reagan, which for the life of me, I haven't been able to, I've been making the, the trek from Olympia to UCLA for two years at that point. And so I had never been able to make that trek be less than 30 minutes. So you mean to tell me that this is okay for somebody who would be at Olympia 30 minutes prior to wait 30 more minutes to get to a place where they will wait even longer and perhaps succumb to their ailments. And that's okay because you didn't make a lot of money right now. So, so, you know, just to have that conversation and even in the, the public hearing to have these people share their different experiences and the different perspectives of their experience and be ignored. I mean, after he gave his PowerPoint presentation, he sat back and was clearly talking to somebody else on the Zoom while everybody else was sharing their experiences, sharing their data, sharing the impact and whatnot. So that showed you that the decision had already been made and it really didn't matter what the community thought. Was there any community connections? Absolutely. One of the um, networks that I did an inter interview for was Spectrum. And Spectrum went around to the neighboring apartments and complexes that had older adults that lived in them and asked them, you know, what Olympia meant to them and what does that mean to not have Olympia there? And so a lot of people expressed that they would treat that place like it was their primary care facility. There was a lot of wound care that was going on there. There was a bariatric place that was going on there. People that needed CTs and they would have to wait forever would come to Olympia to have those things done and so you know to not have that resource I think was you know just sad altogether but then to take that resource away in the midst of a time that is unknown to most of the people alive right now <laughs> right I just thought was just really despicable honestly just despicable and so with the union um, the, the first target was Electo because Electo was like the parent company, um, that owned Olympia and, and, um, made the, the business decision or whatnot. And so they pretty much washed their hands and so, and tried to put it off on UCLA because they were saying that, oh, we made the deal already. It's sold, um, to UCLA. So it's UCLA's thing. Right. And so the thing about, you know, coming against UCLA was UCLA already had plans and UCLA's plans were far off. OK, and so since UCLA plans would fall off, they maintain that, hey, we never said they couldn't, you know, lease it and still, you know, do what they do. You know, what I'm saying they decided that they were going to close in March. They didn't have to. So it wasn't of our own unctioning to tell them, oh, no, you need to you need to can this and can that. Because from what I heard, the plans for UCLA was to uh, make it a mental health facility. Not that it didn't need one. Right. Because I told you it's a keen mental health population there because they like to expand Ronald Reagan to take those mental mental health uh, area from Ronald Reagan and make it an Olympia campus and expand the med surge there over Ronald Reagan. Great. Beautiful. But is that going to happen tomorrow? The answer is no. 
And so, you know, ideally, um, one of the things that I shared with the nurses union that what I'd like to see was uh, basically a titration. Can we titrate? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> did, did it ha did it have to be <laughs> you know instantaneous? Did it have to be so? Oh, we're gonna stop it right here and that other. Especially when they started talking about the new strains and and not knowing about the virility of the new strain and, and the impact the new strain from Africa, the new strain from England, and all this other good stuff. So you don't know the impact of those. You don't know the impact on the community. Can we hold off for six months? you know and so that wasn't even an option you know and and inherently out of all the people that we talked to no one really had the power to say hey hey rescind that business decision short type thing it was really just uh, like let me shame you let me let me use my bully pulpit but okay that didn't work oh well kind of thing and so you know it, it's really sad it's really sad not in line to tell you like I told the uh, owner of Olympia I said um, it's a slap in the face um, because from his presentation, uh, it totally disregards the nurses who put their lives on the line to come to Olympia and um, to, to care for those patients. Even when acuity was down, I've been called in the middle of the night. I've been called at 11 o'clock. Oh, we don't have nobody. Can you come in? It was an uptick, right? Because I was telling you the, the, the flow is different. So maybe from 7 to 11, there was two. And then all of a sudden, it's like everybody called each other at 1130. There was 25 in the weight room all at the same time. Like, you know, and that kind of thing happens. And so, you know, I would make that joke. I was like, do y'all know each other? Like, wow, like all at the same time. And then you have several runs at the same time. And runs, you have to seat runs. Runs come in. You're like, OK, let me find a bed for this run. And they're not coming in because they want to say hello. They really needed care, you know. And so to hear uh, an owner you know, say that, you know, we only do this and we only do that. Um, when I have that tangible experience, it's a slap in the face because not only do we do more, <laughs> but we've been called to do more during the pandemic. If they cared about people, they would care about their nurses, they would care about their doctors, they would care about their community. And so none of those things usurped the care about the dollar. And it was especially disheartening to hear that they got $26 million for a COVID relief fund and uh, are shutting in the middle of the pandemic. So where'd that money go? <laughs> and so uh, on top of that, being privy to the actions of the union, uh, they are refusing to give um, per diem nurses uh, any severance. Um, but the severance that they're offering is um, a week's pay per year that you worked there, uh, provided that you're full time and or part time by by March 31st um, and a cutoff of 12. So anybody who worked beyond 12 years are only going to get 12 years, have seven, 12 weeks of severance pay. Right. And then let's say in January, because you heard that they were going to close down, you needed to start making a move to work somewhere else. So you went per diem. You're not going to get anything like who came up with that? Like that. How is that advocating for nurses who put years and years and more than a decade of their lives uh, into serving the community from this hospital? And like you're like, oh, so we're going to give you three months to um try to figure out what where you're going to go from here sort of type thing uh, and not offer more. Um, they have, you know, hours that you've accumulated for COVID pay. They were automatically given 14 days. If you got COVID, I feel like they should have paid that. They had 24 hours of education. I think I felt like they should have paid that. Anything that was still pending on them chests that could have been um, given, provided that you still had a job. I feel like they should have paid all of it. Uh, and so like they're basically trying to tap out without leaving anything for uh, nurses and or the other people that works at the facility. And that goes from um, uh, environmental services. You know, they had a high tick in um, their uh, workload because of COVID. Because, you know, now you're calling in for every single room instantaneously because now you need this room in order to get this patient in the room. Need to be, they need to, it needs to sit first and then be watching this sit after and before you can put another patient in there. And they needed to do all this extra stuff, take all the, 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 um, mattress off top and bottom and spray everything, wash everything down the whole wall, like every single thing in all of these single rooms, every single shift all the morning, all the night and sweep the main areas and mop the main area. Like, so, you know, you have them putting in all this extra work and you still finding ways not to, to compensate them in some way. Like, you know, it's just despicable. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, even though I've had all these different experiences, um, and, and clearly I have expectations, I think one of the major um, things that I can take away from all these experiences is to be empathetic, to be empathetic, to be compassionate. That's, you know, whenever I gave an interview and they say, oh, you know, did you did you want to say, say something? And I'd say, yeah, can we care about each other? Can 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 we just care more about each other? Like I know your experience is your experience, but can can you find it in your heart to care about the experiences of others? Because even in research, I I see how careless we have been as a people, as a human race. We've been really careless. Like we pride ourselves on building these hierarchies where my needs are more important than your needs. My beliefs are more important than your beliefs. My skin color is more important than your skin color. And we do it in so many levels, in so many instances, in so many environments that it becomes innate. Like we innately say, oh, 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 you're not a manager. So what you say doesn't really matter. Or, oh, 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 you're just a CNA. So what you say doesn't really matter. So we create these hierarchies where we don't really care about each other. We don't really care for each other's perceptions and feelings and, and things of that nature. And I think that if we did, the world would be different. The world will be different. And, and that's on so many levels, not just in nursing, but the world will be different in so many ways because um, one, I, I hate to get religious, but one of the, the spirituality leaders that I have for myself when I think about the things in the Bible is that it tells you, you know how you set the best things for yourself. Like I want to have the best cereal. I want to have the best milk. I want to have the best time. And I, I reserve those things for myself. Well, you are called to reserve those things for everybody else, too. Right. I want to give you the best of the things that I would like to give myself. Right. And so that boils down to treat people how you want to be treated. Do things that you would want somebody to do for you. That sort of thing. And so, you know, it just reiterates to me like who I want to be as a person. Right. Like I would rather be a help than a hindrance. I would rather, you know, be a leader that that is not only speaking to power, but also empowering the people who I lead. Right. Um, because all of these experiences I can learn from all these perspectives I can learn from. Don't put all of my my thoughts and all my eggs in one basket because, you know, this this one resource is telling me this is telling me this is telling me this. And I heard it a million times. So this must be all that exists. No. Not at all. Right. And so I think all of our um, experiences um, are learning opportunities. Right. And we get to choose whether or not we learn from them. We get to choose what we take away from them. And I think that we can take away a million and three things from just two occurrences. Right. And so with that being said, if we preface what it is that we experience with just care, just care. Care for it like you care for yourself. Like you care for yourself. I think we'd be in a better place, you know, especially, you know, shutting a, a hospital down in the middle of a pandemic, you know, and granted, these people, they don't need a hospital right now, right? They don't need a hospital right now. There's nothing the hospital can do for them right now, right? But can you think about the things that the hospital can do for others right now? You know, and, and that wasn't even a possibility, unfortunately. 